Hi, this is Phil from SkiThought.com. We are here with Jim Schaffner again, where we had a great video on the history of the Solomon SX boots. But now we're going to delve into the Solomon driver series of binding and how that evolved. We're going to start talking about a little bit predate the driver and also get into the driver through its generations to what we currently have now with this drive. Now, Jim, let's remind the people what your experience with Solomon was. So I, uh, first of all, ski raced as an athlete on Solomon. Before I finished my career as a ski racer, I started doing some early testing and intros of product for them. And when I stopped ski racing, I got hired by Solomon um, initially to work in racing service in the early 80s. And I worked for them for a little over 20 years and uh, got a chance to see the development and the improvement of the product we're going to talk about today from what's on this table that's about the date of when i started uh, all the way up to uh, the mid 90s so starting in the 1970s solomon went through the years they started off actually building ski edges and actually um, i believe also from uh, cha chains that they worked on and saw and saw blades Correct. and edges Correct. and then they delved into the bindings and where they really started making waves was with the 404 and 505 and those two bindings evolved into the widely popular 444 and 555 that we have displayed here ironically these two pairs of skis the free sellers are going to love but i found both of these actually on craigslist when I was just looking for ski swap stuff and somebody had their auction, their sale over a weekend and they didn't sell and it was free to whoever wanted to pick them up. I mean, two really, really important skis from their generation, but I digress. But both of these bindings then evolved into, into the late 70s, the 727 and the 727 a keep. Now, these here, I really consider probably the most modern of bindings that were ever produced in that generation. We have a lot of items on this that were really the standard for today. We've got a heel that pretty much is copied by almost every manufacturer today with the two-stage heel. We have an integrated brake that retracts that, again, is the standard for a lot of the bindings that we have now. We have a toe piece. It was a single um, a longitudinal mounted spring in the toe, but also... It has upper compensation in the toe, too. So, again, in a rear with twisting fall, that was extremely important. Something we didn't have anything other than a plate binding at the time, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say there's two major deals. Uh, one, you've already talked about the fact that the toe piece on the 727s could actually... Uh, address a combined load fall better than anything that had been designed to date. Mm -hmm. um, but something that's really subtle that isn't maybe talked about so much, but uh, the, the interaction between the toe cup and the boot on the 404s, the 444s, the 555s, and the 505s uh, had no um, a Teflon, if you will, between the uh, binding itself and the boot, where when you look at 727s, um, you've got uh, Teflon lining the entire toe cup mm -hmm. that comes in contact with the boot. And so that was pretty progressive as well. So you've got, again, in here, you're talking about with that Teflon in here, again, which was really unique in the time. Um, and then the other thing with this here is uh, each wing was individually adjustable. We had the ability of adjusting the... Right the toe on the top, so you had the ability of really controlling the forebody of that foot, the, the, the toe lug. Yeah, and interestingly enough, the, the, the older bindings go back far enough where yep. the, the shapes and their ability to adapt um, weren't as um, specific as they were here. By the time this binding came around, uh, Deutsche Industrial Norm had taken over all right. boot production, uh, and these still had to function with, with boot soles that weren't quite so pure. Um, which is kind of interesting as well because um, this, one of the similarities you could make between how this binding works and how like a modern marker works where the AFD actually moves yeah. with the, the sole of the boot, um, this function the same way is that you wanted a little friction between boot and binding because the actual toe cup moved to the side with the boot, carrying the boot mm -hmm. this way. So you actually wanted interaction. You didn't want things slipping. With this binding, though, you clearly wanted the boot sole moving against uh, the toe cup as it was going off center and returning to center. Yeah. 
And one of the downfalls, again, the pitfalls of this was the metal-to-metal contact with the rollers and the body of the binding. Correct. And that's, at the time it, it was developed, um, the main difference actually between the lower level performing uh, bindings was the amount of travel there was on that roller bearing mm-hmm. metal to metal before it went off the corner and opened up. Um, so this had what much less uh, ability to absorb shock and return to center um, than this one based on the shape of the plate that the bearing moved on. And then they took uh, the ability to absorb shock a whole nother step further when they started doing single pivot bindings mm-hmm. with the 727 and the 727 to keep. Yeah. Well, even seeing your hat and seeing my shirt here, that this 727 is just synonymous with the Solomon colors that we, we've had that over the course of years. And I would love to see them bring back variation of that color. We'll talk about that in towards the end of the video. So now let's take a look to see what how this evolved into the 1980s. Okay, now, Jim, now we're into the 1980s, and the 727 evolved into the 737, and then for some reason, we, they went to a three-hole pattern in the toe. We're not quite sure. You're not sure. If anybody does remember that that's watching this video, please put it in the comment section below so we do understand that. But really, when things started exploding for Solomon was with the 737. 47 and that was we've got the keep here we've got a race version here which is the whopping 12 to 20 din all metal version of that and then also a unique version here the 747 magnesium let's talk a little about the 747 but let's also focus on what they did with magnesium okay so first of all the the magnesium uh was kind of an interesting story because it w- was a story. Um, when you look at the two bindings uh, of the regular 47 and yep. the 47. We got a side camera again. over here. We can put it in front of that. Um, so uh, in terms of looking at how they're constructed, they were pretty much identical with one exception, and that was in the body of the heel. There was a little bit of magnesium in here. And I, <laughs> I don't want to under-exaggerate or over-exaggerate, but it's not like this one weighed 10 pounds and this one weighed two. It's like this one might have weighed, you know, six pounds and this one weighed 5.8 or 5.9 yep. pounds. But more than anything, um, this version came around uh, as Solomon was preparing to debut their skis. They wanted to do a little bit of a test, if you will, of the retail community that was supporting Solomon, and they they targeted their best dealers with this model binding that was slightly different than anything else that they produced that also carried a higher price as a way of testing to see whether or not our retailers could push the, the, the binding price limit, if mm-hmm. you will, slightly higher. And that's where the magnesium came from. So it wasn't a high technological advancement. There was some magnesium in here, but just enough magnesium to be able to put the name magnesium on it and get away so you know if it was a you know a, a couple molecules a couple drops uh that's what made the magnesium the it's magnesium. like one brand using titanium on their bindings correct yes but at the time it was really just to designate something different at a different price point to see if the retailer could push that into the marketplace functionality was the same Absolutely. but it was this this unusual black version of it which quite frankly at that time all the bindings pretty much looked the same you knew you could tell from three lifts away what's what what somebody's binding was whether it was the seven uh 747 um even the 727 if they were on a marker rotor mat which were red and white tyrolis with the black or silvers so you knew what the bindings were there weren't a lot of 
options in colors. Exactly. So and, that's what set that apart there. Yeah, so color, the story, and yeah. the price is what separated it away. But the thing that's interesting now is there, there probably isn't a lot of the market that's even aware that this existed because the number of uh, sold into the marketplace was relatively limited. So it, you went to our best dealers and you said, okay, we've got this product. It's kind of special for you. We'd like you to buy a lot, but a lot for a retailer at the higher DIN mm -hmm. level, uh, you know, might have been a pre-pack of 10 or 20 pair or something like that at yeah. the time. And this is also a time where even going, starting with the, taking a step back to 737, and I'm noticing this as I look at this here, is when we started the distinction of a tab heel and a worm heel. So we see a lot of questions on that, even with the more modern ones. So is it a worm heel? And the difference is the tab heel was the adjustment for an app, and you would move that, for, you lift up the tab, move the binding, and it clicks in. The worm heel was the screw in the center here. And if you notice where a lot of this is plastic, this is more metal here. We had four screws on this. Holding the heel, you had five screws here. And that's when we started seeing that, which were common the differentiation when we got to the STHs when we'll talk in some segments coming down here. So that's when we started seeing that with the 37. And quite frankly, I'm noticing this as we're doing the video. So this is uh, picking my brain too in, in this process. And we see it here with the regular 747, even the uh, the red key peer and the race version of this guy over here, which is the all metal one. And this is also an error, even going back to the 727s, that we had the Delrin housings that just did not hold up to the pressures that that, that spring really was containing. Yeah, and it should be, um, a, the point should be made that the higher end bindings, the higher performance bindings have always benefited from greater weight, greater mass means more shock absorption, more absorption of energy of rattle yeah. and, and whatnot and so solomon fairly uh early on in the 80s started shifting to the plastic heel housing mm -hmm. and the tab adjustment versus yep. the worm and um even to this day though uh the race binding still use a worm yep. drive it's more precise and they tend to make the, the, the heels out of more metal mm -hmm. and less plastic. Yeah. And this is one of the things that we talk about on our site when we talk about what makes a binding better. And you're not necessarily buying a bigger spring. You're buying that better housing. Yeah. And, and you're creating that coupling between you and the, the boot and the ski. Yeah, although uh, the, the higher DIN springs tend to uh, begin at the keep level for right. most brands at a, at a, at a max of 14 where the plastic bindings typically go to 12 or 13. Right, right. And we'll, we'll see that sometimes. We saw it, um, again, looking a little bit down down here, is like with the STH 12 and the STH 14, there was some sharing of that heel. Absolutely. And we saw with, with the other brands too. But again, when we get into that better, that that higher housing, and we notice a lot once skis got wider, is that, that, that pressure, that, that downward pressure, we're putting on that wider ski. Oh, yeah. So that's where we do see a difference. Now, getting into the end of the 80s, we get into, which I think, what I refer to as going from, we said we went from black, uh, from color, t uh, color TV, black and white TV to color on uh, the 444 and 555 to the 727. Now we're going to HD. Because now we're getting into the 957 and the differences that came here. And this was, even though the bind looked very similar, a lot of huge advancements here going to this one here. Well, once you start off on this one, then I'll add along to it. Okay, so the main advantage uh, when the uh, 57s rolled around, the 957s, uh, was the multi-control toe. Yes. Um, I don't know if we well, did, we, we have into here. It. Well, but this was just one year prior, okay. so it's not like these are ages apart. Right. Um, but essentially, the the multi-control toe, instead of relying on kind of an if-then statement of movement, the way the 37s worked or even the original 27s, which when there was upward pressure against the toe housing, mm -hmm. it released the pressure of the spring to allow the binding to still release within its normal range. Mm -hmm. Whereas in bindings of that era, prior to that or from other manufacturers when you got a lot of load upward on the toe mm -hmm. it would make it very hard for yep. the, the jam to escape toe. 
So what they did with the, the multi-control version of these, though, was to actually make this AFD um, like a pedal that had a cup that went up into the toe of the housing. Mm -hmm. So if there was any pressure down, and that pressure down could be a forward force straight down, yep. or it could be a twisting force, which is going to have leverage on one end of the binding and pressure on the other side. And that pressure down on this AFD would do a very similar thing. It would reduce the amount of spring tension it took for the boot to escape. So it made this toe piece one of the most reactive and the safest toe pieces available in the era. So the improvements, uh, and it's interesting to kind of look how Solomon approached this, but they typically approached both performance and safety at the same time. So they're always trying to get as much uh, safety out of return to center and the binding's ability to absorb shock and safety in terms of the binding's ability to address for compound action falls, so combined load falls. So in straight forward in a, in a binding system, you're relying mainly on the heel and the, the type of pressure on the leg is a bending force. And the leg is typically four times stronger in bending than it is when there's any kind of torque. So the torque is typically felt on the toe piece, and that's why historically Solomon has focused on the toe to eliminate the spiral fracture or the twist type of fall that comes from a release at the toe. And not that the, the heels weren't a, a concern, but it's a simpler element in terms of how the lower leg bones got injured. Right. So these really were an advancement that stays with us from the early 90s through right now, you still have similarities in terms of how the Solomon toe pieces work to help uh, keep the release consistent at the toe, regardless of whether the person is coming forward with a twist or just twisting laterally, um, the binding has a, an ability to read those forces and release or retain accordingly. Yep. The other cool thing with going to this here too is this is where they also change the toe in that where we'd be held from the front of the boot and the lug to being held on top of the boot. And example here, again, is we got the boot here, Solomon boot, but it held in on top of the lug up here. Uh, so what Solomon felt at that time was this is a part of the boot that didn't get a lot of wear, where this could get chunked up and it could create some resistance under here, even though these older ones do have some Teflon in here, they still could get caught and they felt that this would be a smoother release point up here. And the other thing that changed on this is that the wings got a lot longer, so you had a little more elasticity. and. It, in my history with the binding, and I started off in a 444, and I remember getting the 727 when it first came out and thought, oh, this is great. It's the most modern thing, and yada, yada, yada. But I remember being up at Camelback, and I was skiing Asp, and I spun around, and in the fall, I was on, I remember the equipment exactly, I was in Solomon, uh, the Nordic Comp 3 boot, I had my Rossi ST skis, and I had a 727. A keep on it and a 195 and I remember going into that mogul backwards and a rear twisting fall and the binding released and I created a lot of confidence in the binding at that time and I remember the second time then and I, I skied that bind for a while and I remember being up at Killington and I was on conclusion and I had demoed a pair of skis that had a pair of 727s on them and that binding pre-released Probably was a poor setting, but I lost confidence at that point. Then I remember when I was at Wick Ski Shop, and Mark, rest in peace, uh, our rep at that time was Rick Boulay, who came in, and we started talking about this by the 7957 that just came out. And we talked about my situation, my experiences, because I switched over to another brand at that time um, with a turntable heel that I had to put on manually. But switching over to this binding here and getting the confidence back in the brand. And I've been a loyalist ever since. And a lot of it, I love the single pivot toe and the elasticity. The other neat thing with this binding from a tech standpoint that we really liked um, is that the brakes were removable. So it was a single screw here. So for working on your skis, you weren't dealing with rubber bands and, and holding that brake up. It was very much easier to work on the on the on the edges at that time. It was also really neat is this is when we also started seeing color variations in bindings. And you can see the whole collection that we have some different examples here going down to the seven 
57, 857 all the way up, which at that time also matched the boots really nicely too. Yeah, so uh, interesting story is that when the, uh, you know, I talked about the timetable of this coming along right before the ski got introduced. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're to this version that has the upper control, the 957, but this color were the original colors of the, the SX-92 Akeep yes. and the SX-92. And the first skis that we showed the dealers to test were all this black, white, purple, and blue, yeah. or pink and blue. Um, and so everything, you know, for kind of the first time, uh, I think globally, there was this setup where everything matched. Yes. Yeah, and we saw that in the pre-production, and that ski was actually in Europe for a year before it came here. And then we're now we're coming to the 1990s, and now we're going to talk about how those colors change and the ev next evolution of the bindings. Okay, now we're into the 1990s. And this is where we had a lot of evolutionary changes in the bindings for Solomon, but what we saw a lot is a lot of additions to the basis of the binding. We went from up to the 957 now, which matches the colors of the skis and the boots when they introduced them in this country, that, which quickly evolved into the 977. But now we went from the multi-control AFD to now with the damper underneath that into the uh, the 977 and again we're also seeing a lot of these color options that we never had before which actually put pushed other manufacturers to get into color options of their bindings too instead of having a basic red and white one or or a simple um, silver or black they needed to get into colors and catch up too and we saw then the coloring through here but also got into a lot of plates in their bindings and, and Solomon, one, one of the things I've always respected about Solomon is they never shied away from taking chances right. and throwing something against the wall to see if it sticks. It usually did, sometimes it didn't. And we might have a little bit of a miss here on this table, <laughs> being that of uh, getting into the pole pro, pole pro, pole, pro, pro pulse. pulse. <laughs> uh, but the suspension though was a unique binding. Yeah. Let's talk, let's focus on that for a little bit. Whoops. Well, so before we dive into that though, okay. let's just talk simply about uh, uh, getting to a point where the discovery that some kind of lift or rise uh, added leverage okay. to the ski. And keep in mind, um, in the timeline we're looking at here, skis were pre still pretty straight and yep. uh, fairly long. Uh, and by adding elevation to the binding, they felt that they got to the edge quicker and it added more leverage. So as we get into talking about the three here, all of these are lifted or bindings with plates underneath mm -hmm. that offered um, you know, better or different type of control. So, um, so there was just a straight lift and then the suspension was an interesting product that helped absorb the energy um, of the action of the bend of the ski so that when the ski came out of uh, deep bend, it would actually absorb, you know, some of the floppiness of the ski uh, in uh, this plate that ran from the heel through the toe. And there's a dampener as a part of this assembly that could actually piston back and forth and absorb energy, especially when you were skiing fast. So I really like these mm -hmm. on uh, like my GS race skis. Yep. I use these for a couple of years and found that they worked extremely well. Uh, and then transitioning from this uh, into the Pro Pulse version, this was Solomon, I think, really taking a stab at improving the way skis performed. But in the end, this wasn't very uh, long lived. I don't think it lasted more than two seasons. Mm -mm. And part of the problem was, is that it was fairly complicated to mount and adjust. And in a lot of cases, we saw out on the hill that the bindings weren't properly set because there's a connector bar yeah. uh, between the heel and the toe that typically was missing yep. the connection or piece, loosened itself or yeah, <laughs> it had come, it come loose. But you know, aside from the fact that these were lifted, the, the idea behind the pro pulse was that it would give energy coming out of the turn mm -hmm. to the skier for the new turn. And I don't think it actually performed to its level, but these three ideas of just straight lift the suspension and then to the pro pulse, were all uh, due to Solomon setting its designs on the way the skis performed and worked and not so much about safety. Obviously, it's the same yeah. binding that they were focused on safety in other places, but when they started to plate and lift, that's when things got interesting. And then I want to talk about one other aspect of that, which is also true to the pole pulse. But if you look at these this way, you can see how much higher the heel is than the toe. 
and this was a special plate that was different than these where these were the same height toe and heel um, where it elevated um, the heel piece quite a bit so therefore it changed the delta angle um, onto the high side of elevating the heel and I think what's interesting about that is over time it's proved out that having uh, a really high delta isn't really a, a great benefit um, but at, at a moment in time there was this belief that by elevating the entire heel of the binding, you would get better action to the front of the ski. Especially in a time when we had boots that had a lot of forward lean in them too. Exactly. So there was a combination of a lot of different things going on. And I remember when these were coming out, uh, Solomon took some of our dealers uh, to an independent mountain. We had five or six pairs of skis mounted up with different bindings, yeah. and we rotated through them. And that's when we got on the suspension, got on the propulse, got on the regular binding, and also some bindings from other manufacturers um, where again we had a binding in the past that had the ability to adjust in three different positions for marker the selective control that was built basically as an on-demand four-wheel drive where this was kind of built as an all-wheel drive where it went in automatically and I remember my first pair of these um, I had mounted on a pair of uh, SCXs yeah. And it worked pretty well on that ski, or at least I felt it did. So going back, and I'd be interested to go back now and try it with a regular one. And I remember my first pair of suspensions that I got when that first came out is when, when the 9100 first came out. And that was the first delving, their, the first big change in their GS skis and change to the side cut. And they also shortened the ski a little bit. We went from the, the PRA, which was a 212, down to yeah. about a 208 or so. And... I got on that ski, and boy, was it just so quiet and yeah. just so smooth on the snow. And I remember um, I was good friends with the rep back then, and he wasn't there. He had one of his other guys doing the demo, and I went back to the tent, and I said I gave um, I gave him a blind check. He said, give this to Rick. He said, I'm, t I'm keeping the skis. So I just love them so much. Rick wasn't too happy about them. It's only a pair. But, but, but he, he – he was fine with it. What's in the funny, run. Phil, is I skied that same combo of the 9100 yeah. uh, GS ski and this binding, and I, I, I raced like, you know, masters in the East at the time when I had this setup. Yeah. But we, all, we talked about the driver plate, and then they got into the sphere, which, I mean... The feeling back then is we, we had more forward twisting falls than we had rearward falls. And the idea of the sphere cue was that it worked laterally on here in the pivot. So in that forward twisting fall, that felt that that could help release that a little bit. So the, directly, I'd say, yes, that was the idea behind it. But it's also important to understand that the idea behind the straight across um, uh, multi-control driver plate and the spheric had the net same effect that if yeah. you look down inside... That there pin. was a little steel cup and a pin that came down through the, the toe piece onto the cup. And that cup was controlled by, again, either straight downward action or, in this particular case, I talked about how when the boot twists, one half of the boot sole is pushing up on the, the, the toe, the other half is pushing down. This kind of adapted better to that than the flat straight across um, AFDs on the multi-control driver bindings. So having the spheric... Um, allowed the boot to actually kind of pivot off a center line, if you will, and reduce tension or pressure between the boot and the binding even more. Yeah. So even and, safer. Yeah. And I remember this is also the first time that we, we saw knee safety in advertising in a binding, it, which is a big step for brands. Yeah, we and we have to be, have to be a little careful about that because yeah. even, even today, uh, you know, the binding is really uh, still designed around protecting the bones in the yeah. lower leg that are inside the boot. And the reason why is that the only thing that talks to the binding is the boot. And the only mm -hmm. thing that talks to the leg is the boot. So the stuff above it, like the knee, is still a bit of a mystery. Yeah. You know, we <laughs> had the knee binding, and now we've got Tyrolia and head, uh, you know, with a version of a binding that in theory can, you know, break free from the heel. But it's still uh, about the amount of pressure that loads up at the toe. Yeah. And um, there's still a lot of protection offered the bone in a forward twisting fall, but the knee is still a, yeah. a, a bit of a mystery, even though this was, uh, I would say, an improvement. Uh, Solomon was always very cagey about saying out loud <laughs> that these bindings protect the knee because the reality is, is the binding really only protects well the lower leg inside the boot. Mm -hmm.
Now, the one the plate that we don't have here, um, you see in our picture right now, is the Derby Flex, yeah. which actually was an independent company that Solomon purchased, I believe. Correct. It originally was called Derby Flex. Solomon bought it. They renamed it D-Flex or mm -hmm. branded it with Solomon on it. And what's interesting about the D-Flex is it fits right into this whole family here. Yep. And, you know, back in the day for racers, you would see maybe a D-Flex on a ski with additional uh, a 10 or 11 millimeter risers. Um, and then this was going on simultaneously as well as this. And the reason uh, I think that Solomon bought D-Flex was that at the very highest end of the spectrum for ski racing, it clearly was an advantage, even though that wasn't the intent behind yeah. the design of that product. It was originally designed by uh, a doctor who was trying to help uh, ski race athletes at the highest end recoup and recover from injury. And the very first guy to start skiing on it, I think, was Mark Giardelli. And uh, if you know Giardelli's history, he had uh, quite a few knee injuries. Okay. And he was one of the first athletes to adopt it, but it was adopted originally uh, to help dampen and absorb the chatter on the skis when you were at really high speeds on hard snow to take pressure off the joints. And uh, what was interesting about it is two things. One, after Solomon purchased it, the, the ski racing community was still quite enamored with it, but it put Solomon in this interesting position where all the other manufacturers, ski and binding, had to come to Solomon yeah. to purchase these plates. There wasn't like a free program, um, you know, like where every athlete could get a free right. G-Flex. Uh, surely the Solomon athletes was part of their program, but every other brand actually had to go to Solomon and purchase the, the, the D-Flex from them, which was kind of a funny happenstance yeah. at the time. And then also you can see we've got a bunch of variations of colors here. In the 57, we had the colors. 77, we had a multitude of colors. And even the 97, which the yellow here is one of the most popular um, colors in that one there. Then we've got into the 900s down here for down. Um, and the, at the very end of the 90s, before we got into the 2000s, which is coming up now. Okay, now we're into this century, into the 2000s, and not really, not a lot really changed in the driver collection from Solomon. Toe cosmetically changed a little bit, what I refer to as the bubble toe, and came up a little bit higher. Um, somewhere along the lines here, we got away from the, the independent wing adjustments to a single adjustment on some of the bindings, but it's still the STH that became popular. Uh, that name came back for for Solomon and what they wanted that is just to make it STH referred to stronger than hell or some different uh, words you might want to use in there also but they had the, the 12 and the, the 14 and the 16 we've got the 16 here the the 12 and the 14 were basically the same binding other than spring the 16 we got into a metal plate underneath it um, and all of them did have the five screw in the heel. But we also had, which is probably the last of the Solomon race bindings, was with the labs. We have them along here. And then the one-off, which I believe was just one or two years, was they brought the STH steel back, which was basically our STH that brought back all the metal goodness of some of the earlier ones. And I remember when... I was a start house and we got these in. It was probably the most expensive bonding at the time of around five hundred dollars. It was like four hundred ninety-five dollars. And I if I remember correctly, the uh, the army or somebody called but they bought them all that we had. <laughs> we had like maybe about a, a dozen pairs or so and they said we, we took they they took them all. But this is a really nice binding here. But let's talk a little about this generation and specifically the lab, which is probably more in your area too. That these racing. Well, first of all, if you just you know flip these over sideways and look at the heel housing, you can see um, this is plastic. Yep. Uh, and then the all steel one is all steel. Um, and you know it's got the uh, five hole pattern heel, the the steel clip on the on the travel plate. Um, so definitely bomber bomber more durable. So that's really the story between STH uh, plastic STH STH steel, and then um, the lab was just uh, more or less the same binding as the all steel. Um, the main difference was there was a connecting bar uh, that went on the plate that was on the race keys, that came with the race keys, and that just helped to keep the ski flexing and moving underneath the binding and allowing uh, the binding 
to not load up in forward pressure when the ski was bent deeply. Um, so the main deal, and it wasn't really much of a lift if you look, it's just a couple of millimeters, uh, but you needed this piece to have the connecting bar uh, between toe and heel on the lab version. Okay, so I mean this series here, move them along the side over here. Then we get into the big boy bindings. And these are the ones for the guys that have the extra long cranium, the knuckles drag. They don't they're probably the second generation of family that walk upright that are looking for a high din binding. And we're talking bindings here that start at eleven to seventeen or even fourteen to twenty. 20. Yeah. Which so yeah twelve to twenty. Yep. Uh fourteen to twenty. And so these are 14 to 20s, 14 to 20s. and there's 11 to 17. And the difference between the 11 to 17 and the 14 to 20 was the 14 to 20 had two springs in it, right? Uh, correct. Yeah. Like we, a, a, an outer spring yep. and an inner spring. And then take this apart here, and we've got these two springs here, and you can see this little small inner spring inside here that was the difference there. And then the other binding, let me grab it, is the seven, the original 727 that I have is actually a, doesn't have numbering on it, just had dots on it. Right. And that was referred to as a black spring, right? When it was out? Well, black spring, green spring. Yep. Uh, you know, all along, there's been for years, actually dating way back to oh, the... The, the early 70s would look, you know, where they had different color designations uh -huh. springs. But, but the race binds were either called black springs, race springs, green springs. And what's also cool with this one here being, the, and you can see the, the green that's in here. You can see it in the picture that I'm showing you here. But also the where everything else has just a single slot for a driver, this one here has the cross slot, the cross slot, which I thought was also interesting. So in there's that. actually a technical reason for that. Okay. Um, back in the day, the tool they used to use to adjust the bindings on the hill uh, was just a L-shaped piece of metal with a with a like a uh, uh, plastic handle over the metal and because these springs were so stiff it was hard to get a full turn to be able to get it back on again so mm -hmm. by crossing it you could make these little uh you know little 20 degree pushes on it similar to this something like that exactly so this little l piece on here allowed you to actually adjust it on, when the person was on snow to just move a little bit at a time instead of trying to get like a full turn so that's why they had the cross hatch on it it also was a quick way to identify from a distance uh -huh. whether it was a race binding or not so that was really interesting to this series here and this is the binding quite frankly i'm afraid of I don't want to get in a binding that starts at 14. I love the idea of the housing. I love the idea of a coupling, but no way am I going to ski a binding that starts at a 14. Yeah. Now, the, the one difference here, and again, from the technical side, is we've got basically a 14 to 20, which is a span of six. There's some brands that we might see a span of 12 in the binding. Yeah. What was the difference in this and why they only went to that short, shorter span? I, I don't have a great reason for it other than just the way that this binding functions. Uh, the Solomons have never had like a, a 10 point mm -hmm. uh, uh, differential where a lot of uh, the other race bindings, like uh, there's a marker that goes 14 to 24. Yep. Um, so um, so I don't have a good answer for yeah. you. Even the why. new um, icon is, is 14 to 24. Exactly. Yep. So, but I think that part of it is just because of um, the location of the pivot point and the, the size of the spring only leaves so much room uh, to be able to adapt the spring uh, in that much span. Really cool. And right. I mean, through this series, again, we've had some popular colors through here. One of the proposals that we actually sent to Solomon, uh, working with Dave Peterson, our artist, is we took three of the more popular bindings colors through the years, the original 727, the orange and silver, yeah. the 747, the white and the red, and also the 997 yellow, did a mock-up on the STH2 and have for Solomon to make that, you can see that in the picture, but talking a little bit about the STH2 and how that brings into it this design from the other ones. But I mean, obviously, they're staying with the STH name here and going to the two and modernize it, but there's so many similarities between this old going back here to this one here. I mean, from a distance to the naked eye, people could think it's the same binding. And we talked about the when we go into the 957 holding in from the top with the STH2, we've got that ability, but also rollers. Yep. So it would release smooth through there. 
still has uh, the same basic design here. Toe, toe hole pattern, still the same right, from, from the old one. Yep. And the only thing that really changed was the wing, uh, as far as in the back. And then we got into a wider platform because that was one of the weaknesses of a lot of the early ones. They were never designed to be on a wide ski. Correct. And the leverage that they created was a huge difference. Yeah, and if you look on this heel, the way it flares from the body, yep. instead of the screws being directly straight down, it's flared out and it's moved the yep. hold further out towards the edge. Yep, so you can see that through here as far as that flaring to give that greater platform on there. So that was very interesting that they did that. And then they evolved then into what they have right now is the new stride. <coughs> okay. Which toe wise on what they were adding on this and talking to Chris at Solomon is that they want to lower the center gravity of the toe. And they felt that that lower center of gravity, and this actually kind of reminiscent almost of the um, the 555 as far as in coloring, as far as in even in design, that similarity. But they dropped it from about 33 millimeters high here to down to about 20 millimeters. That they felt they get a little more reactiveness out of the toe. Heel design on the 14 is a little more compact than this one here. It's a tab where when we get into the SDH 16. I'm sorry, the uh, Strive 16, we go back into this heel again. Yeah. And one of the things to say just about the evolution of the bindings and the brand is they're still making improvements and they're still yep. making changes that um, that cover two areas. One, the protection, yep. the way it protects the lower leg, and two, the way that it performs. And whether it's how it grips a, a wider ski or how it gives energy back or how it absorbs energy while skiing, are all factors that the brands have to deal with when they're producing bindings yep. and testing bindings. Now, I've been always been happy with that. And the other thing I do like with Solomon, what they did is when we test a lot of skis, we don't want to be thinking about the binding in that test process. Right. And the Strive demo, one of the things that they were adamant on is the same stack height as the retail counterpart, yeah. where a lot of the other manufacturers, the binding reacts differently. For and sure. I mean, how many times have you worked a ski wall? Somebody come in, I demo this ski, they buy that same ski, they come back and say, boy, is this the same ski I even demoed? Yeah. It feels very different. And we don't get that with that Strive well, demo. Yeah, it speaks to the, the ramp angle of the binding or the delta of the yep. binding, which in a lot of cases, and I don't know why, but when it comes to demo bindings, uh, because of the adjustability of both toe and heel, uh, binding manufacturers in general tend to lose the plot yeah. and they give you different setups. So either yes. the toe will be higher or the heel will be higher. Yeah. And so you can go all over the map to the retail version. But one of the things that's been nice and consistent about Solomon over the years is they've always kind of been in the middle of the pile, never the highest uh, amount of Delta, never the lowest amount of Delta. And they still continue that to this day that um, you know, their delta ends up being somewhere between two and four millimeters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, between heel and toe on, on a generalization. Although it does, uh, you know, it, it's cool that on the demo bindings, they've tried to respect that. Yes. It's the same dimensions um, where a lot of manufacturers have not done that. And it definitely, you do get that situation. Oh, that absolutely. Tried. And that's one of the things I really do respect about Solomon and what they've done and their commitment to that. And that's one of the reasons that we do choose to go with Solomon on our test skis is I want to take that variable out and we want to take it out for our testers also, but they did a super job with that. But there's still a lot of heritage going back to this one here. And I remember even uh, when we were up skiing with Scott Schmidt, up at uh, Yellowstone Club, who Scott loves the SCH steel. I mean, he's he, he has probably uh, as many pair of them as anybody, and he was skiing that day on the Strive. And one of the things I asked him, and Scott, if you 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 know you know Scott, he doesn't mince words. And I said, what do you think of the binding? And he says, I can't tell the difference. And to me, that's as right. big of a compliment for the binding as I that yeah. I think he can receive. So he did a really good job with that. But the, uh, that gives us a bit of a history of the driver series from Solomon a little bit before, a little bit after, but how this binding really revolutionized the industry in consistency and performance as much of a performance as a binding can add to a ski. And also kudos to Solomon for taking chances along the way and trying different things. And one thing that they not one thing nice with Solomon is they don't double down on <laughs> on the misdirection. They back up, let's go a different way. Yeah, which not, I thought was always good. 
Yeah. So, which I think was really good. Thank you, Jim. I mean, just a wealth of knowledge here and your experience with Solomon um, and your contrib uh, contributions on the site. This was just a, t a wealth of information. Uh, if there's any other videos that like this that you would like to see, please put it in the comments section below. And remember, folks, skiing is fun. Thanks Don't forget, y'all, skiing is fun. Keep the FU in fun. I'm taking the elevator down. <sighs> If you enjoyed this informative video, hit that bell, subscribe so that you'll stay up to date on the new videos, and check out SkiTalk.com for more ski related content. Also, please follow SkiTalk.com on all of your social media channels. And remember, no matter how still you are, Ben Stiller. <laughs>